to that need and build as many as the community needs. The skate park serves a great purpose. It provides access to skateboarding to those who might not otherwise have it. The skate park also serves as a training ground to entry-level skaters. But the wood cannot be confined to a skate park. It's in the nature of a skateboarder to search out the new to skate the unskatable. The vehicle of the skateboard takes you on the path less traveled, and along this path, a new interpretation of the world around you is revealed. Everything is skateboarding, so no matter where you look at it, who's televising it, it's still skateboarding. And you can still go out there and be a skateboarder and express yourself and show the masses what you feel is skateboarding. The skateboard for me was a way to get away from my parents' uh, divorce at the time and to go explore the city. I was too young to drive a car, but it was like an independent vehicle to get around. Through skateboarding, I've been invited into the houses for dinner in like rough neighborhoods in Brooklyn you know, where I would never have ended up, you know. And then also in like just these mansions on the hilltops <laughs> where I would never have ended up. I don't think it's strange that like, as skateboarders grow up, they become musicians and artists and these other like independent self-driven activities. It's like, you've kind of just got to be motivated to go down that road and, you know, take those kind of risks. And like, I, I don't know, I think skateboarding kind of primes you for that sort of shit. I mean, there was a whole scene created from that, from that anti sort of establishment sort of attitude. Ah, I'm gonna cut my pants up or whatever, just to, and it, for a shock value, to tell people to fuck off, to tell people you don't care, you know, bleach your hair and do all this wild shit. And people were just, you know, to offend. It was like, because I don't wanna be part of your world. It's about like, everybody, man. Like, this is what I do. This is how I do it. And I don't care what you think. And on a less mainstream, more like retarded extreme level, I guess there's like the way it influenced snowboarding and rollerblading. Like as much as snowboarding and rollerblading want to claim their independence as these like other extreme sports, they need to bow down because the names of all their tricks and the basis of everything they do is based off of skateboarding, you know what I mean? Like it's another way that it's like lent itself into these other subcultures, I guess. It just opened my world, you know what I mean? So I went from this kid that um, just lives in this 
suburban area of Cleveland and surrounded by other kids that are just closed in their little worlds and all of a sudden I felt like I was like just exposed like to this huge bigger picture that nobody in my neighborhood could even comprehend you know what I mean you really felt like you're really a part of something super cool you know young kids especially they're searching searching for something that says this is me that's you know this is kind of an outward way of saying that Oh, yeah. The graphics have a way, it's a way of, it's, it goes kind of in hand with the creative thing. A lot of people took the graphics to heart more than just a simple uh, silkscreen job. It gave you a way of defining yourself, defining where you were. Um, for me, it was, it was all, I, all I wanted to do was draw skateboard graphics. Plus head spoof. There's a certain, uh, there's a certain embodiment that it has. Uh, so many people, um, when they see an old board that they once had, it just brings back all these memories. Everything, just the time period, and it's uh, with that with the book. A lot of people, when they look at it, it's just it's it's really overwhelming for them. Just to re also to remember, like I had that board, I had that board, I was doing this then. This is I, oh I got busted there. Like it's so they have they have this. Psychic life, I guess. I'm 38. How many people my age can relate to an eight-year-old? Very few. But it's what you have in common is skateboarding. Regardless if you're skating, you know, a ramp or if you're skating a block or whatever you're skating, you still have something in common, which is pretty cool. And I, and I hope to think that it's more of a brotherhood, you know, and understanding that when you first started skating, I mean, you were the black sheep. You were the outcast. And that's why you started skating, you know? because it was an independent thing, you were a loner, and that's what you did. But then you see other people and you have some sort of common ground and bond. Skateboarding can be a solitary revelry or a shared experience among friends. It can be a backlash to authority or something you do when you have some time to kill. Whatever the reason, the wood binds generations of skateboarders around the world. So this is the circle right here. This is, these are the guys. We're always together. We have a great time. We spend a lot of quality time with our kids, which is the most overwhelming thing for me out of, out of all of this. This is why I did this, to have these people around me, because they make my eyes tear up. <laughs> These are great people. This is the Cerna clan, a group of family and friends bound together by the wood. Three generations who find common ground through the skateboard. See, this guy lives for skating. That's what he is, skateboard. He'll sit there with his spoon and ride his spoon and his cereal bowl. Everything that he looks out, it has a skateboard in it. But it's cool, that's because of his pops. You know, dad's skating with us and it's been down through the generations and that's what we do. That's how we get our joy, having our boys learn how to skate, being out there with us. Mom coming out, you know, us doing big barbecues, going camping, the whole thing, you know, it's, it's just, it's rad. It's the only thing that gives me more joy than my skateboarding is to see my kids excel, to do good in school, to do good at skating, to do good in life overall. And um, I think we all thrive for that. Each and every person who rides a skateboard has his own experience with it. The skateboard is whatever you want it to be. And the life of a skateboard is as varied as the interpretations of the wood itself. Describe this object for me. Describe this object? <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's interesting, actually. <laughs> this is called the skateboard. Skateboard. Blank deck. Yet to be filled with life. Functional. It's a deck. I know what it is. Made of wood. Skateboard that's been made with hard maple. It's got five plies running the length of the board and two plies running across the board. Some holes drilled for your trucks. It's blank. I mean, there's not, it's not branded at all. This is the lifeblood right here. 
I don't see it any different than a baseball mitt, a soccer ball, a bat, a basketball. Curvaceous. My first love. Love it, hate it. Also, it's a way to go sort of interact with the environment around you. I can derive so much fun out of something like this. Flip it. Flip it the other way. That was hold promise. It could be your meal ticket to get over to Europe to go skateboard. A vehicle, first and foremost, yeah. And just looking at it, you go, yeah. This is where it all starts. This is where it all ends. Shredding time. <laughs> skateboard die? I think it's got to be alive first, you know? Well, no, it's just an inanimate object, man. It ends up stored in your basement or on someone's wall or in a landfill. The birth and life of a skateboard probably starts out the same, but then it's a matter of what kind of kid winds up with it. I killed it <laughs> for my enjoyment. There's so many ways it can go. Is a skateboard ever really dead, you know? People turn them into art. They, they are definitely memories. The best thing in life to have is a memory. And if you've got a skateboard, there are memories that go with that skateboard. So did it die? If it's in your thoughts, even if you went to the garbage dump? No. arguable whether a skateboard lives or dies, but there's no doubt that the wood creates memories and unspoken bonds between those who ride. These bonds are strong enough to bring some to collect the very object that generates these memories. The Skate Lab Skate Park and Museum in Simi Valley, California houses the largest known collection of skateboards. Around the world, skateboard art shows are regularly held. Books, films, and installations chronicling the legacy of the wood are released increasingly more. But it's this intangible desire for the memories spawned by the wood that is the root for so many collectors. The collection. I have 287 boards and they're all, it's, it's every board that I have ever ridden since my first brand new board, this Caballero right here. just started out as, you know, my board got old, I took it apart. I didn't want to throw it away because it's like, my parents bought it for me, one. And two, it's like, I just don't know if I want to throw a, a, a board away. And then before I knew it, I had a little stack going. And then I realized, like, I'm really deep into this and realizing how when I look back at my boards, it conjures up memories, you know? So then I was just so deep into it, I just, I kept saving them and saving them, and now this is what I do. I just, I save every single board I ride. This was the first brand new board I ever got. My parents bought this for me. Christmas 1988, Steve Caballero, Powell Peralta. The best way I can describe them is they're my, they're my substitute for photographs. Big Brother interview. The first time I ever went to California, Rode that in Australia. This is the evil board. In Paris, Germany, Cleveland. <laughs> I, I look at a board and I just immediately zoom back to that time, you know? These are my early years and, and these mean the most to me, probably. They're not trophies or anything like that. They're just uh, markers in my life, I guess. These were all my amateur days skating for Black Label. As soon as I pick that board up, you know, my mind just gets flooded with all the memories of that tour, you know, like everything about it, you know, and I don't really have that many photos, you know, but I have that board. A sample of my pro model right here. 
and when I turned pro, I was just going to take an already existing shape to be my board. And Paul Schmidt is the guy that makes black label boards, and he convinced me, you know, to come down to the shop. And you know, he was like, "Hey, Christian, you know, like come down, like let's let's you know fool around and try some shapes, and you know, find something you really like." So I think he wanted me to ride these boards and give them back to him and tell him what I thought, but I kept them obviously. And then this was it. This was the first finished, finished one. First pro model right there. That was the childhood dream come true right there. Sometimes like if I did tricks that meant something to me or whatever, I'd write that on there. This was a, it was a pretty big trick, I guess, at the time, at least for me. And it was a big 50-50 grind I did on this huge hub ledge down at UCSD. This is a really important one to me. Some people know this footage a long time ago. There's a, a hub -a ledge up in Hollywood, and Fountain and Vine is the, the cross streets. And a long time ago, I was doing some tricks on it, and I fell, and I, I knocked out my two front teeth. Oh, oh, Years later, 2004, I went back. I did a frontside blunt down that ledge, so. I mean, for me personally, it was a really cool because I had lost my teeth on that same ledge years ago and never went back. So, so that's a that's a good one. Hang on to them and hopefully, you know, maybe pass them down. Maybe I'll have kids one day, pass them down to them or whatever, and <laughs> let them burn them. <laughs> it's a little insane. It's a little obsessive, you know, but. Uh, you know, I don't know, it's like, I've been doing it for 17 years and I'm so deep into it, it's like I can't stop. Uh, hopefully, you know, when a kid gets a new board or when I get a new board or even when I look at these old ones or hopefully if other people look at their old boards or they're looking at my old boards, it, it puts life into them, you know what I mean? It somehow inspires them or whatever and gives them life to, to do whatever. While some collect for the memory the wood supplies, others see the maple as muse. Decks become the canvas of painters. Some remove the object of the skateboard far from its original form. And some transform the deck long before it hits the streets. It's become cool for art shows in the last couple years for people to send out shoes or send out skateboards or send out toilet seats and like everybody paint on this thing and send it back and we'll have a show of painted toilet seats. It actually started because uh, I got invited to be in this art show in Portland a couple years ago. Paul Schmidt sponsored this show and sent out these boards and on the top of the board that I was supposed to paint it said like, you know, handcrafted by Paul Schmidt. And I was like, well, that's pretty crazy. Like, I'm the one that's got to paint this thing. So I was like, just to kind of have fun with it, I like cut the board all crazy and like painted it. And uh, when I was done, I was like, well, that's actually pretty rad. Like, what I started to do is just kind of a funny, like, take a nudge at Paul Schmidt for putting his name on the board that I have to paint. Uh, actually turned out to be a cool idea. It was a great way to recycle all these boards. And uh, people have a nostalgic thing about skateboards anyway, and as far as collecting them and hanging them up. I'm not treating it as like a skateboard based art form. I mean, yeah, it's a cutout skateboard and I painted on it, but it could as well just be a random piece of wood. I'm using skateboards because it kind of ties into what I do for a living. Also just because I like the idea of saving them and giving them a new life and just, but the themes and the, and the